I want to give you a basic review of the laws of success you must honor. You must see them as valuable to create an uncommon life, an effective life. The gospel has two parts, the person of Jesus and his principles. The person of Jesus is different than his laws. Every law has a different reward. Every law has a different reward. The completion of one law does not give you the benefit of a different law. The Bible is about statutes, laws, commandments, Jesus called them. We often call them instructions. The Bible takes 56 hours to read. 800,000 words, 66 books, 1,189 chapters. It is a book about the law of God. It's much more a book about the laws of God than it is the love of God. Men embrace the love part of the Bible for comfort, but it's the laws that create change. His love does not create change because he's loved the whole world and many of them remain unchanged. His laws create change. This is significant that you understand this part of the Bible. The person of Jesus is different than his principles. The love of God is different than his laws. So I'm going to give you a brief review because it's very possible that you're receiving God's love and seeing no change in your life because of an unknown or ignored or rejected law of God. It's very important to me that what I believe is working for me. If something's not working for me, I re-examine it. Something is not correct here. I told you some months ago, I went through a great mind crisis, a great mind crisis because over the law of the seed, great mind crisis, because I had planted hours and energy and money and knowledge into people without a change. And it unraveled me inside. It was a, a disturbing because suddenly my very root philosophy that everything is a seed or a harvest my root philosophy that something I've been given will create something else I've been promised. The very root of my belief system was threatened. I watched people that I had taught and labored and sowed my very life into become something totally different. It would be like a dog having puppies and out comes a cat. And out comes an elephant. And suddenly you say, you know, somewhere there's been a mistake made. Now, every parent has looked twice at his child and said, I better do a DNA test. Somewhere something happened. This is not my kid. Did I produce this? But it was so disturbing to me that I had to go back and say, I may could I be wrong? I didn't think I was wrong. Because the law of the seed is much more than money, as you know. Seed means beginning. It means that something I've been given can create anything else I've been promised. We know that battle is the seed for territory. We know that honor is the seed for access. We know that confession is the seed for forgiveness. Something I've been given can create anything else I've been promised. I was disturbed. I couldn't sleep. I went through the most trying, difficult time of my, because my philosophy, my persuasion was shaken to the core because I did not see the harvest from the seeds I had planted. And then I had to dig into the word of God and find out there was another law besides the seed. And it was the law of the soil. 
that the seed does not change the soil. That the soil will, the seed will reveal the quality of the soil. Then I understood why Demas could travel with the Apostle Paul and never be changed. Judas could have suppers with Jesus for three and a half years and never change. The law of soil. But it was disturbing. So I have to dig when something doesn't seem to be working. I have to re-examine it. Look at it closely. Have I broken a law? Have I ignored a law? And I have made many mistakes, still making mistakes, by not looking for the appropriate law. Did I ignore a law? Did I try to, did I break a law? And could it be affecting me? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, begin with verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, the judgments. I thought I just needed God to love me. No. Which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. That you may do them in the land whether you go to possess it. And here's the reasons we won't apply the law. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God. To keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily. Now, these are the rewards of knowing these laws. I listen to the same teaching you do throughout the earth. And sometimes a part of a truth is deadly because it blinds you to search out more. Sometimes we take a part of a piece of knowledge and we run off. We, I have a couple... It worked for me that the moment I start my instruction, they listen to sentence one and their mind takes off after about two sentences and they do not hear the rest of my instruction and the whole instruction is off. And I say, I know when I start talking that you immediately are ready to go, but you must stay to get the entire instruction. I use for an illustration when I offered a school of ministry of million dollars if they would jump out of a plane. Two million, three million, four million. Nobody, nobody would accept it. And I said, now, there's another piece of knowledge. It's already on the ground. Would that make a difference in your decision? Uh-huh, that would make a difference in your decision. This is why it's so important to hear, to listen, because one part of the instruction can be deadly unless you hear the other part. Among preachers, there's a popular saying that if you follow the scriptures out of sequence, we'll deal with the law of sequence because what you do first determines what God will do second. The Bible says that Judas went and hanged himself. There's another scripture that says, go thou and do likewise. How many don't think they belong together? I don't think they belong together. My father often said, rightly dividing the word of truth, knowing where something applies. These laws are critical. I observe in my personal life how many people are waiting for God to do something. And there will not be any changes because they don't know about a law. A law. He will not give me through relationship what has to come through knowledge. He will not give me in my secret place what has to come through a law. I must honor a law of God. I'm going to give you some of these laws. And it's important that you really, this morning in man talk, I showed the men. I have two bills. One has 500 on it. One has 50. And I asked the men, 
who would rather have the 500 over the 50? Now, normally we would say, of course, any fool can say you'd rather have 500 over 50. Except there's more information here. This is Nigeria. This is Europe. In Nigeria, 1,000 nairas is about $8. So this is $4 in American money. This is over 100 bucks in American money. So what looks more is much, much less. So it's really important for us to, when we listen to conversation, listen for accuracy, listen for details, and be swift. My goal is not to teach you a little sermon and say, I'll see you next Sunday. My goal is to thrust into you every conceivable law of God I know that will produce a reward in you that will diminish your discomfort in the earth, that will remove the pain that's scheduled for you. That's my goal. And a single law that is broken can produce profound losses and pain. And a law that's implemented, and you have to know it because everything is learned, unless it's the birth instincts, everything has to be learned. Even the fear of God has to be learned. The most important thing my father stressed to us was to know the voice of the Spirit. But his greatest contribution to the seven children that lived, two did not. But to the seven children that lived, my father's greatest contribution was a basic fear of God. A fear of God. He stressed that. I can talk to you in five to 15 minutes, discern the level of the fear of God in your life. It is impossible to have a fear of God and not have an honor for men of God. And it's impossible to honor men of God if you don't have a fear of God. It's not in you, you can't. And I study and I look for this. And I'm thankful my father taught me a fear of God. The Bible says that these statutes and these laws and these commandments, these statutes and these laws of God teach us to fear God. God seems more interested in being honored than he is being hugged and kissed. He wants to be honored. That it may go well with us. Say that with me. That it may go well with me. Oh, say it again. That it may go well with me. Does God have a need for um, to be a dictator? And does God have a need to be uh, have slaves and peasants and all of us scrambling around him like little gophers? And I go, I'm sorry. I'm, no, God's not suffering from insignificance. He is showing us how to keep order in the relationship. Remember my father's statement? He said, it's okay for a father to play in the floor with his children. But if he stays there too long, the child will forget who the daddy is. There's some laws I want to sow into your spirit because your success is very important to me. I have achieved... 99% of all of my goals. My goals now is to document through books what God has revealed to me and to sow them into the body of Christ. So I'm going to teach these things because they're very critical to your success. If you want an uncommon life, number one, these are not alphabetized nor are they placed in order of their importance. Number one, the law of difference. The law of difference. Success depends on your difference. Our similarity creates comfort, but it's our difference that creates our salary, our reward. You married your wife because she was different. 
Your difference decides your income. Your difference determines who pursues you. Difference. It's important for you to discern your own difference from others. God is the author of difference. The pecan tree is not the pumpkin. Difference is the creation of God. Difference determines your worth to another. You must look for difference in conversation. Listen for pain. Listen for information. Listen for knowledge. And you always listen for who the person honors. Never, never judge people by their resume. Because no one has a better resume than Lucifer. Who worked so long side by side with God. But you listen for who they've chosen to honor. You listen for difference. You study for difference. You must know your difference. You must look for the difference in those around you. Second law is the law of honor. Honor is the willingness to reward somebody for their difference. Honor is the willingness to reward someone. Whether it's because they're aged, it's because of their achievement, it's because of what they've done. Honor is not only, now wisdom is the recognition of difference. Wisdom is the recognition of difference. But honor is the rewarding of someone for their difference. You'll hear someone say about somebody, well, he puts on his, his uh, pants one leg at a time just like everybody else. That's someone that's trying to strip somebody of their difference. You'll listen to the talk shows and you'll hear dishonor in the tone, disrespect. You'll watch them show a picture of our president and then make sneering remarks about him. It's an unwillingness to demonstrate honor. Honor for his position. Honor for what he's accomplished. Honor him for his position. You may, not dis you may disagree with his decisions, which I most assuredly do, but he is worthy of honor. It's very important that we never move away from the law of honor. Someone asked me this morning, Dr. Murdoch, I want to work side by side with you, but I can't get to you. What should I do? I said, honor the people who do work side by side with me. Honor is the seed for access. Honor is a prediction of your future. Honor reveals the character of the one sowing the honor. Not the character of the person honored. Pharisees didn't honor Jesus, but he was worthy. So when you honor someone, you reveal your character, not theirs. Your character. The law of honor. I'll say this repeatedly. If I see who you're willing to dishonor, I can predict your future. If I can see who you're willing to honor, I can predict the favor that will flow across your life. I have created many losses in my life through dishonor. I have lost so much through dishonor. I'm still learning it right now. This very part of my life, I am struggling and laboring to understand the power of honor and the inevitable losses of dishonor. And it's very hard if someone dishonors you not to respond with dishonor. But it's important for us to learn how to stay honorable when others are dishonoring us. To stay honorable. Three, the law of reward. The law of reward. We know that right now in our government they're making perhaps the deadliest decisions ever made in the history of America. For the first time since 1776, there is a government defiance to the law of reward. God said it this way. He would reward every man according to his work. According to his work. According to his work. To whom much is given, much will be required. 
The law of reward means I can set the level of the good things that come to me. The law of reward is very simple. When you solve a problem, you create favor. Favor is the currency for money. Everywhere you see favor, you see money. There is no mystery to reward. The Bible says even in eternity that the penalty system will vary for people. I find that fascinating, unexplainable, and I'm not a theologian. He said some will be beaten with many stripes. Some will be beaten with few stripes. There seems to be even different levels of rebellion that attract different penalties from God. That's understandable. It's very normal that if somebody solves problem number one, they get $10. But if they also solve problem number two, now they get $12 an hour. And now if they solve problem number three as well, they get $14 an hour. Now if they solve one through five, now they may get $17 an hour because the problem you solve determines your reward. There's no mystery to that. It rules the earth, the law of reward. If I don't like the rewards I'm receiving, I change the problem I'm solving. Many years ago, over 20 years ago, I walked in the office and my secretary says, uh, I want to talk to you. I said, okay, I'd been gone. She said, I want to make a thousand, I want to be paid a thousand dollars more a month. I want my salary to increase a thousand dollars more a month. And I said, Oh, I do too. I want mine too. I want mine too. And she said, uh, so, so will you? I said, when I hired you, I gave you a list of problems that I would pay you to solve for me. And we agreed that you would solve this list of problems for this salary. Now you want me to raise your salary. So what I need from you is an additional list of new problems that you will solve to earn your $1,000. Now if you will give me a new list of additional problems to solve, I will pay you that $1,000 a month if you will solve those new problems cheaper than somebody else will. But if you want $1,000 to solve this new list of problems, I may walk over here with the new list and ask somebody else, would you solve it for $500? Because if they'll solve it for $500 a month, I'm not going to give you 1000 That's called the law of profit. When I hire somebody, it is based on this. I am going to reward you with money. I'm going to reward you with money to buy food, money to buy house, money to buy clothes for your family, money to buy gas. You'll be able to buy a car if you will solve this list of problems. God runs the whole universe that way. He gives you a list, if you will do this, this is what I will do. Turn to Isaiah 1, Isaiah 1. Say the law of reward. Isaiah 1, 17. 18, 19. Learn to do well. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. Verse 19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. If, if, he shows us if we do these things, this is your reward. If you don't do them, this is your loss. 
Let me give you a quick run through of what we're going to be discussing later on. So you can, this is the law of reward. The law of knowledge. Number four, the law of knowledge. Remember that knowledge is the seed for change. The law of knowledge. Remember that pain creates a desire for change, but knowledge decides the change. That's the reward of knowledge. He calls himself in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, the spirit of knowledge. In Ephesians 1, 17, the Holy Spirit calls himself the spirit of wisdom. Remember that changes are always proportionate to knowledge. Five, the law of obedience. You can only be promoted by someone who gave you an instruction. The law of obedience. You can only be promoted by someone who has given you an instruction. Six, the law of authority. The divine purpose of authority is provision, protection, and promotion. If there is scriptural authority over your life, there is an umbrella of protection. That's the reward of authority is protection, promotion, provision. Seven, the law of agreement. The law of agreement. The law of agreement. Two people agree on the same thing. It becomes literally miraculous. Eight, the law of excellence. Excellence cannot be hidden. Excellence cannot be hidden. How many want to walk in total excellence in your life? How many want to walk in total excellence? Say it out loud. I want total excellence in my life. Say it in every part of my life. In fact, let's lift up both hands right now and thank God that he is going to enable us to walk in divine excellence. I never tire of the wisdom of God. Wisdom is the ability to recognize difference, right and wrong, evil and righteousness, difference in people, difference in a countenance, difference in a moment like the blind man crying out to Jesus. The dominant purpose for wisdom, and don't you love the wisdom of God? I'm so thankful you're listening today and watching and being a part of the internet, telling others about it. And I hope you're getting, by the way, I hope you're getting my daily podcast every single day on your iPod or your MP3, every single day, two minutes of wisdom, be a blessing. Sometimes I go a little over because I get excited. I want you to be a part of this ministry. I believe that when you get involved with God, he gets involved with you. I am one of the ministers of the gospel who believe the words of Jesus. I believe every word he said. When he told Peter that there would be a hundredfold return on any investment in the gospel, in Mark 10, 28 through 30, I believed him. When the word of God says in Malachi 3, that if I bring the tithe, which is 10% of my income, and the offering back to him, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour me out a blessing I don't have room enough to receive. I believe him. Why would I believe God about heaven and hell and not believe him about the blessing of the Lord? I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, it's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope, but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the wisdom quick scan Bible. The wisdom quick scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this quick scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.
8, the law of excellence. Excellence cannot be hidden. Excellence cannot be hidden. How many want to walk in total excellence in your life? How many want to walk in total excellence? Say it out loud. I want total excellence in my life. Say it in every part of my life. In fact, let's lift up both hands right now and thank God that he is going to enable us to walk in divine excellence in in every part of our life. Say this aloud. Holy Spirit, I accept your invitation to love your word, to embrace your word, to walk in total obedience to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. The law of excellence. Look at that for a moment. And I'm going to give you some of these laws just to think about. They're powerful, the laws of God. When we break a law, we create a loss. We schedule a loss. When we honor a spiritual law, the favor of God begins to flow toward our life. Let me go back to 7 to 6. Now, we'll cover this more this afternoon on the Internet and also there at your home throughout the coming weeks and next Sunday morning I want to continue this because I see so many people coming to me for prayer when they've broken a law and prayer prayer will not create what the obedience will create it really is important that you walk in obedience it really is notice the law of authority let me stress this that the the blessing of God comes down through the chain of authority through the chain of authority I am not permitted by God to correct upward. I am not permitted by God to correct upward. I'm not permitted to correct my father. I may disagree with my father, but scripturally I'm in defiance. The Bible says witchcraft, rebellion, is as the sin of witchcraft. I cannot correct upward and keep the blessing of the Lord. I can't. And that's real. If you'll listen to Esther's conversation with the king. She had every right. This was, this, this was her husband. Her husband had embraced a wrong influence. Her husband had made the best friend, Haman, a man of influence in his life, and he was dead wrong, completely. Con- but she did not correct the king. She exposed his adversary. She exposed her adversary, but she did not enter into any correction of the king. Why? She was under his authority. That's critical. That's important. It's important in this house. It's important in your job. It's important tomorrow when you go to work and your boss said, this is what I'd like for you to do. It's very critical that you stay under the authority. Now, if you say, well, I don't agree with my boss and I don't agree with her, then the law of choice kicks in. You could go and church, work somewhere else. You can go and be a part of somebody else's life, and you can build your own business. You can do your own thing. But it's important that we understand these laws. Sometimes I have notes given to me, and someone tells me how much they love me, but they treat the people around me like dirt. They're very, dis- they're very, very d- rude and, and just treat them like, uh, I'll never forget one of the pastors in Indiana, Paul Pano, great church, got me back to his office. He said, I want to show you what one of the ladies just did trying to claw. And she he literally had blood. She had clawed his hands trying to get past him into the private area. There was a dishonoring of authority. These children here are children. But one of the things I want them to learn is to honor authority. If they don't learn that in this environment, where will they learn it? Never. Teachers are afraid of their students in the public schools. They are scared. The public school right now is one of the most dangerous places to be because there is a defiance of authority. Let me take you down the prison zone. And I'll show you many, many men and many, many women whose parents were not there to teach them the law of authority. Now let's go back to eight, the law of excellence. Joel Osteen had some wonderful teaching this week. 
that when you, when you do your job, do it with excellence. Do your best. Look at it when you're finished and say, does this represent me? Martin Luther King had some of the greatest teaching. He said, I don't care if you're a street sweeper. Treat it as if you were Michelangelo. Treat it as if everything you did was a photograph of your excellence. Very important that you cultivate comfort with excellence. The resentment that mediocrity has toward excellence is profound. There are many people intimidated by excellence. Some of us will go into a nice store and we almost get like this. Oh, oh I'm not comfortable. So we want to go over to the Goodwill where everything's piled up in stacks of throwaways. Now I'm at home. I think it would be wise for you to cultivate a comfort zone with excellence. Wanting things right. My sister Flo has been helping me this week get my ties right. And, uh, and we were, so my travel room is a little messy right now. And I was looking through there this morning, and she is so good at putting things in order. I mean, exceptional. She can take what took me two months to tear up. She can put it together in an hour or two. So it sort of encourages me to let it go so she'll know and she'll put it together. But I thought this morning when I went to look for a tie to put on, I thought I need to develop real intense comfort with excellence. I want to become so comfortable with excellence that the lack of it makes me stop and say, let's get it right. Let's make it right. And it's very easy to let yourself go. But I wanted the law of excellence. Remember when the king says, tell me about Daniel. And they said this about Daniel. They said, he is a man of excellent spirit. Excellent spirit. Excellent spirit. Takes time. Takes time to hang up your clothes. Takes time. When I came back with all my, all my, uh, my stuff from Nigeria, we had several cases and I'd brought some of my own food and brought some of this and to go through there and pull out the dirty shirts and the sweaty shirts because I was uh, like I was soaking wet the end of every minute just drenched and uh, hours every day and I, I didn't I didn't want to do that I just I almost wanted to burn all the clothes I mean to start brand new I mean just wanted to start brand new every day but I had to pull them out send them to the cleaners let's make it happen excellence takes time it takes focus and sometimes you have to have people but to help you. But it's important that you develop a spirit of excellence. It doesn't make you critical of others that want to live at a lower level. But for my level, I want things right. I like my house right. I like my car right. I like things right. Look at the next one. Nine, the law of the mind. The law of the mind. Your mind is a garden. You kill snakes, you pull weeds. If you fail in your life, it'll be because of your mind. Your mind is your world. If you can succeed with your mind, you'll succeed everywhere else. Your mind is a live organism. It's a live messenger. It collects data and gives you an opinion of it. And it's really hard, very important that you work with your mind. You must give it an instruction. You must tell it what you want it to do the information you want it to collect. Your mind is a sizing machine. It resizes memories or pictures of your future. Your mind has two functions, the memory and the imagination. Your memory replays the past. Your imagination preplays the future. Your mind is your personal responsibility. It's no one else's. The mind can be damaged. The mind can be broken. I know in my life, I know areas where I believe my mind is broken. And how do I know that? Because sometimes what should not be an offense becomes an offense to me. And I know that my mind has taken an offense and, and magnified it, made it bigger than what it was. I know sometimes my mind is broken because I have a tendency to want to meditate on yesterday instead of tomorrow. So I realized that God made me for a future. He didn't make me for my past. And sometimes in my private moments, 
I will find myself revisiting painful experiences in my past and still trying to learn 40 years later from something that happened 40 years ago. That's broken. Sometimes I can tell at the end of the day that I haven't meditated on my future, that I haven't invested thoughts in my dreams and goals. I can sense, huh, I'm, I'm replaying painful yesterdays instead of picturing the future. So I have to work with my mind. And I ask the Lord to cleanse my mind. And I know that his word is the master surgeon of taking out wrong things out of my mind. It's very important for you to give attention to your mind. I spent two years studying the mind. I was fascinated. It, uh, I could say so much about the mind because it took two years of my studies growing up in my teenage years because I realized that a Christian with a damaged, unhealed mind will have sorrow and disappointment far more than the sinner who has learned how to manage their mind. So your mind is an important part of your life. If a mother doesn't take care of her mind, she'll hate her children sometimes. She'll resent them. She'll say, I tell you, you know, you'll have every kind of thought in the world. We see people who have never been taught to manage their mind. That's a whole other world, but it's important and it's critical. The law of the mind. Ten is the law of peace. The law of peace. We know that a person carries strife. That strife is not in the air, it's in a person. The Bible said if you remove a person who carries strife, you'll have peace in that environment. Peace has a different reward than passion. Peace has a different reward than passion. Passion is movement, energy. Peace is embracing the present. Embracing the present for its reward. He, told, he called us to be people of peace. He calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of peace. You can have peace within you when there's not peace around you. You can have peace inside you when there's not. And there's several keys to the law of peace because there's times. And one of the things I found and one of the things I teach in the school of ministry is not to introduce controversial subjects if you don't have enough time to explain them. And sometimes... We do not understand that words are the seeds for peace or war. Words. Now, I've stressed to you that countries do not go to war. We don't even know people in Iraq. But we went to war. Men go to war. Less than 100 men in every government make a decision to go to war. Less than 100 people. You have a leader who doesn't like what this person does and says, so he has a core group. And then they start the conversation. Peace has a price. Peace has a price. And it is possible that there sometime has to be battle to create peace. For instance, right now, there's great hatred in Iran for Israel. Many of us know that if your neighbor was training lions next door to your children, that would be one thing. You would be upset. You probably would try to stop them from training. But if your neighbor every day put up a sign, said, I'm training these lions, and I'm going to send them. As soon as they get older, I'm going to send them to eat your kids. Would you react? Of course you would react. Well, that's what's happening in Iran and Israel. Iran has said for years, we're going to wipe Israel off the face of the map. There's a hatred that's indefinable. They despise every Jew. There's a hatred from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. So they have made this. We're going to create weapons. We're going to create things that's going to wipe all of you out. So Israel reacts to that. And what would you do if there were lions next door to you? And they were telling you we're training them to eat children. In fact, we're going to test one of the lions. We see one of your children. And what would happen if they sent one of the lions over and ate one of your children just to see, just to do a test. What would you do? Say, we need to talk? I wouldn't say we need to talk. Come on. What would we say? Would we try to meet with, would, you, would, we, would we send them a gift and say, if I give you $100 a week for the rest of your life, would you stop sending those lions to my kids? 
Would you reward somebody for robbing from you? So Israel feels different about that threat than we do. So our government tells Israel, be patient. But see, it's not our kids being eaten by the lions. Sometimes war is the seed for peace. That's why there's an America. The Paul Revere's and the George Washington's and the Thomas Jefferson's and especially Benjamin Franklin who, who strived in meeting with the French and doing everything possible to communicate. We're here in America today because some people stood up and says, you will not send lions to kill our children. We won't let you do it. Now we've got, now we've got Northern Korea, North Korea. It is obviously the leader is insane. It's obvious it's been that way for years. It's crazy, I know. We believe in killing the little baby in the womb, but we don't believe in killing someone who's killing everybody else. It's a real weird. Look at someone next to you and say, stupid makes me real sick. Just look at someone next to you and say, stupid makes me real sick. I find it fascinating that the news is obsessed with poor Dr. Tiller, but they're not near as obsessed with the 6,000 babies that were killed inside of a mother's womb at a cost of 6,000 apiece, which was 360 million he received for killing 6,000 babies. But we're upset with whoever killed Dr. Tiller. But we have none of that for the 6,000 babies killed. You heard the girl say how she had to flush the baby. They, she sat on a toilet and they taught her to push until the baby came out and then she flushed the baby out the toilet. Sometimes the law of peace will require a battle. We have to fight back for what we believe. Good men are not protected, never have been protected. Righteous men have never been protected. The first righteous man was Abel, the son of Adam and Eve, killed by an unrighteous man, another son by the name of Cain. What does that mean? Peace at any cost? I don't know about you, but I'm praying for America. If you ever watch Schindler's List, it is my prediction that what happened to the Jews through Nazi Germany is happening right now through the economy and through the assault on Christianity through laws that will soon strip churches and religions of all their distinctive honor that they have received. Watch Schindler's List. Watch it. Keep your diaries confidential, but don't be afraid to think. Don't be afraid to think. Don't be afraid to think and consider the law of peace. It is not one man. It is a deep-rooted philosophy that's beginning to rise in America. And it's an anti-Christianity position. If, if they said about Muslims or homosexuals what they have said about Christians in the last 30 days. Muslims would be burning churches and burning houses and buildings down. But Christians have been taught to submit, to yield, and we have misunderstood our instructions. I believe Mark 16, 15 makes it clear, go into all the world. And make disciples, make disciples, make disciples, make disciples.
at any cost, at any cost. Spent too much time on that. Let me go through these others. That's been on my heart, as you can tell. Leaven, the law of rest, the law of rest. Never make major decisions when you're tired because everything's the wrong size when you're weary. Both President Bill Clinton and President George W. Bush both said that their major mistakes in their life was when they made decisions when they were tired and weary. President Dwight Eisenhower would never make a major decision after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Don't make any major decisions when there's a weariness in your spirit or your flesh. Get away from everybody. Renew yourself. 12, the law of restoration. God's a God of restoration. Why there has to be restoration? Because ministry is depletion. Ministry is not a practice of multiplication. It's an emptying. Every preacher who walks off the pulpit knows he has emptied his whole life. It's why Billy Graham stayed in bed till 2 o'clock every afternoon in his crusades. Why? Restoration. When you sow, you have to reap to sow again. When you empty, after you have emptied everything that you've given to others, there has to be restoration. When you come in from your job at night, there has to be restoring of what you've emptied. People take out of you when you don't even know it. When Jesus turned around and says, uh, somebody touched me, and the, the disciples were puzzled. They did not understand the law of restoration. They didn't know that something had just left Jesus. And Jesus said, no, virtue left me. My strength left me. I just became less. Somebody close to me just made me less. There are people that in your life, there are people when you get through hosting them, you feel exhausted. There are others you feel renewed and ready. You must identify what happens even in your spirit. There has to be a restoration. There has to be a season to stop. I love Vance Havner, the old preacher from years ago. He said, Jesus said, come ye apart and rest a while or ye will come apart. Come ye apart and rest a while, or ye come apart. Your body is not anointed. Your spirit man is anointed. And your body will be weak even after God has used you. William Branham was a famous preacher from many years ago. I sat under his ministry. Phenomenal word of knowledge and give you a watch his ministry, Brother Holton, I'm sure. People would come up on the plat hundreds, and he would look at a lady and said, your name is Lucille. You live at 1151. You, uh, you had a surgery two months ago. It was astounding. He was known for the remarkable giftings of the Lord. Very boring preacher, believe it or not. But we all sat there for two hours until we could watch his gift work. And so when we got through listening to his preaching, he would call people up and he would give them specific things. He would tell them, we just all sat there stunned. How could you do such a thing? Then at the end of the service, this incredible man who could tell people their name, their address, when they had surgery, ushers had to pick him up and carry him off. Now, I was just a kid, but I sat there and said, something's wrong here. Something is crazy. Why did I have to carry him? This man got power. This man got the power of God in him. Look at it, look at it. And now, he can't, even, he can't even walk off. Something's real crazy. His body was made for now. The anointing is made forever. And you have to know when your body cannot handle any more the anointing. I don't care how much. It's something we see in the Benny Hinn ministry. It's something we see in Reinhard Bonnke. And it's something that ever preach of the gospel. So good to have my pastor from North Carolina here today. Brother Kenneth Pleasant, so thankful. God led you here. God sent you here. There has to be restoration. I want to stop on that for a moment. We'll come back to the other. There's so many laws. If people around you are empty, they're taking what's inside of you. Whether you can measure it or not. Because their need is an instruction to your spirit. I will stop everything I'm doing. There's a little mother. I was coming out of Nigeria. 
And we had, and she, they're standing, and we have a lot of ushers for security. And she was thrusting as they always do. She was trying to thrust her baby close to me. And I knew this was an important moment for her. And her tears in her eyes, and she was pushing past everybody, holding out her baby. Would you just touch my baby? Just touch my baby. And in Nigeria, they have a remarkable understanding of the power of impartation. They know more about impartation than anybody in America knows. They know that the laying on of hands, there is a impartation that occurs. I couldn't tell you how many pastors have knelt in front of me. Please put your hand. I had one pastor of a church of 20,000 grab my hand and push it and say, touch my head. Touch me. Touch me. The power of impartation. I t- stopped everything, stopped the man. I said, let me have the baby. And laying hands on the baby. Now, when the Spirit of God in you is reaching out to someone else, there is an emptying going on in you. Ministry is not multiplication. It's loss. It's empty. It's emptying. And when you get through ministering to others, I don't care if it's a prayer inside of a store. I get in the, the air, airplane, and I was flying from London to Nigeria, and they all grabbed me on the plane and had read my books, and would I pray? Would I pray this one? Would I pray for this one? And I can say, you're thankful, you're great, you're thrilled, but there has to be restoration. Some of you pour into your kids, and you pour out, and you say, what's wrong with me? You have to have restoration. It's why Jesus took the disciples into a, a ship and said, let's just spend some time together. Some of us today, we're not hating people. We're not hating God. We're tired. We're just tired. We're just tired. You're not God, Jr., and if Jesus even rested, you and I can rest. Hebrew says he gives his beloved. There's a place of rest. I'm asking the Lord today that the law of restoration, you wouldn't resent it, You won't feel weak because of it. You won't feel stupid because of it. It's time to be restored. It's time to go back into his presence and say, I'll learn how to be restored. The law of restoration is not a loss of energy or time. As long as you live, somebody will need you. The law of restoration is receiving from God what you need for today. Manna, fresh manna every day. Lift your right hand high. And say, in the name of Jesus, I enter the new day. Fresh manna will come to me for tomorrow. Lord, when I wake up tomorrow, you will give me what I need for tomorrow. Now lift your other hand high and say it aloud. I am a receiver of restoration. Thank you, Father, for restoring me. Now pray in the Spirit for about a minute. Would you pray in the Holy Ghost as our musicians and praise team comes, as our worship team comes? This is the place for miracles. This is the place for miracles. This is the place where healing waters flow. This is the place for answers. Hallelujah. I want to pray over the seeds that you have been planting in this ministry. And by the way, I have an incredible gift you're going to love. In fact, It's probably one of the greatest gifts I've ever offered. We're asking the Holy Spirit for 300 partners this week who will set aside a seed of $300 for our outreaches. I need your help. I want you to help me. Not just to feed a thousand children a day, which we do, or a thousand families, or underwrite the wisdom of Asia Bible College, or to underwrite the tent factory in South Africa, or the home of hope but that we can go into 100 countries with the gospel. I'm holding in my hand the Wisdom Quick Scan Bible. The Wisdom Quick Scan Bible. I have never in my life found a Bible easier to read. As you know, for many years, I've read the Bible through 40 chapters a day, every single month of my life. There is no easier book to read than this Quick Scan Bible. When I found out that I could offer it to you inside of some of the teaching that I've been doing and I'll do today, I want you to have it. Call me right now, plant your seed of 300 and watch God move.